in the long run, passivity won't pay off. It never pays off. If you want a life of meaning and transcendence, you're going to have to move. Aggression doesn't have to be toxic or damaging. Healthy aggression risks. It builds new things. It breaks through barriers. It's the key to living a life that matters. I'm Brian Tome. This is The Aggressive Life. Welcome to The Aggressive Life. Hey, this is Brian Tome. Today we're going to talk about some hyper-important things. You know, it's one thing to think about aggression in a situation where we obviously have to have aggression, like you're on a football field or you're in a field hockey situation where you've got to run forward, you've got to do whatever, whatever. It's one thing to think about being aggressive when someone has a gun to somebody else's head, literally, and you got to be the one to sprint and knock the person down. Or, or I mean, we could go through any number of scenarios where we would all agree and say, oh, well, that in that situation, of course I would be aggressive. Of course I would go for it. Of course I would do something beyond it. The challenge is we tend to think that our normal humdrum lives don't really have opportunities for stepping up and stepping out. We tend to think that, well, I'm just kind of plodding along and my meager existence that I'm doing right now and doing the same old, same old, but by golly, someday something will come along that will require me to really step up and step out and be more aggressive. But until then, I am and insert the normal job that you may think you have. Or until then, I am and insert single or insert married or insert your medical condition or whatever excuses we have that we're, that we're using to keep us the way we are right now. Hey, hey, have you ever thought you're not supposed to stay the way you are right now? Have you ever thought that there might be a God of the universe and he's not done with you? Have you ever thought that there might be a God that has you in what you think is a humdrum life, but really it's only humdrum because you're not seeing possibilities. You're not seeing opportunities and you're not pushing on things that you could push on. You're just assuming that that's just the way it is. Or if I do push on something, maybe things will get more difficult for me. So I have a vested interest in being passive which is what the opposite of being aggressive is. The opposite of aggression is not being nice. The opposite of aggression is being passive, being a passive victim of whatever our circumstances are. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, I don't care what job you have. I don't care what your family situation is like. I don't care what cards you have been dealt there is some place else for you to go where you are right now. And when I say some place for you to go, I don't necessarily mean go to a new city, go to a new job. I mean in the job you're in right now. I mean the family you're in right now. I mean the apartment, the house, the multi-acre mansion you're in right now. There's different ways for you to look at your life and look at the circumstances that are before you and to change it. That's what we're going to get into with my guest today. My guest today is all about seeing things that other people don't see. In fact, if what you hear today doesn't motivate you to get moving, nothing will. Half a century ago, a 15-year-old kid neglected by his parents ran away from his house. He was on a fast track to ruin until a football coach stepped in. He took this kid under his wing, changed the entire trajectory of his life. This kid went on to attend Cornell, play football, and open up some of the finest dining establishments in the nation. If that story sounds familiar, it's because that's Jeff Ruby's story. He was a past episode, and I think last I checked, our most listened to episode. So we thought, why not? Let's go back to the well. But I don't want to talk to him again because he got boring after a while. 
I know you're listening right now, Jeff, and that really bothers you, which is exactly why I said it. But I, I said, let's go one level better. Let's get his daughter in here. So today we're sitting down with the next generation of Rubies, Brittany Ruby Miller. She's taken the mantle from her father. She's turned into tidal wave for good. As president of Jeff Ruby Culinary Entertainment, she oversees 700 employees across seven restaurants spread across three states. These restaurants have been recognized by national organizations like the Food Network, USA Today, Wine Spectator, as among the best steakhouses in the nation. But, you know, she didn't just inherit her position because of her last name. In fact, she started as a hostess at one of her father's restaurants, worked her way up from there, this driven and passionate leader who has inherited her dad's passion for giving back. Let's welcome to the aggressive life, Brittany Ruby Miller. Wow. <laughs> Who wrote that intro? I need a new bio. Yeah, that well, was there awesome. it is. You don't Thank even you. need a bio. You just say, you want to know who I am here? Just listen to this podcast, the very beginning. Well, let's go back to, let's talk food. Brittany really is bumming me out big here today because I was on the run. I couldn't have lunch. And I had what I thought was very healthy, a Cliff Bar, my favorite Flavor is nuts and seeds. And Brittany is trying to tell me the Cliff Bars are no bueno. No bueno. Make your, state your case. You do you. I'm just, you know, trying to stay away from the refined sugar and the carbs that's going to store as fat because currently my body's in ketosis right now because I just don't eat any carbs, which means I'm always fat burning. But you, you do you. How long have you been doing this <laughs> stupid fat diet of yours? How long? It's a lifestyle. I do eat sugar. I it's just a lifestyle don't to sit not, around and eat a, a bar. It's a lifestyle to not eat what every human being has eaten from the beginning no. of time in every corner of the planet? No, but yes. it's all right. What, what human beings have not eaten bread? This is going to go like down a rabbit hole, I'm telling you right now. Justify Look at, yourself. I said, I guarantee there's probably 40 carbs in that. How big would you say that is? Two by two? Um, yeah, I I'd mean, say so. Yeah. 40 carbs. You okay. might as well just go eat a Big Mac. What's the difference? Plus all the sugar, 21 Good grams news. of sugar. Good news. I can eat Big Macs yeah. instead or of this. Or you could have some fresh fruits, vegetables, and lean proteins and g- feel just as fulfilled. And what do you know about food anyway? Nothing. I didn't go to culinary school. Eh. <laughs> you didn't go to culinary school? I did. You did? Thanks for saying that, though. Yeah, yeah. After yeah. I got my undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> well, talk, that, this is all lead in for you getting take a couple nutrition classes in there. <laughs> well, you know more about that, and you know more about keeping uh, fat off your body than I do. I, I'll, I'll give you that. And you do know more about food. You're let, let's talk food. Let's talk food. Like when you were a little kid, was your dad jamming Chef Boyardee down your face, or were you having? High class meals every time. Were you, were you making the meals? Was your mom making the meals? Your dad mm. making? T- tell me about your relationship with food. What is the what is a child in the home of one of uh, the uh, the great chefs and restaurateurs of our time? What's food like for you growing up? Well, I did grow up on Freddie salads and steak and shrimp cocktail and you all did. of the typical classics that we have at Ruby's. But my dad loved to cook, so he and he started in the kitchen at Perkins, actually. And so he taught me how to make scrambled eggs. He taught me how to crack eggs without using two hands, only use one. Um, He loves Italian food, so pasta and sauces. And, you know, he just moved into his new home, so I went over there, and he was making some sort of— what was he making? Some shrimp dip, and he went and got all the ingredients. So I think the passion came from him, and that's just always been important to our family because that's where you you get around a table— and food brings people together. Cracked an egg with one hand. What age were you when you learned that? Five, probably six. And how can you tell us how to do it? This is only an audio podcast. <laughs> how, how would one do that? Because every year I make eggnog over the holidays, which of course you don't approve of because there's probably too many carbs no, but I, in I, it. I do but want to try your eggnog. I followed you. And I, and it has bourbon in it, I think, or it's, whatever you yes, put it in. So it's I'd unbelievable. Try it. So how would, how would I do that with one hand next you year? You just crack it and it's it's there's an art to how you... There's so no way to explain it's it. It's second nature to you then yeah. at this point. Yeah. Okay. So how many jobs did you work in the Jeff Ruby organization before the one you have right now? Hostess. Uh, I worked every position on the line. So saute, prep, manager, servers. Um, wow. I think that's really, that was it. Yeah. And so when you were doing that, at that, at what point did it move from, well, this is a job or this is what the family members do in the business to this could be my life. That probably happened 
when I was in culinary school. So I went really to just prove to my chefs if there was ever something that came up in the back of house that I knew what I was talking about. But through that, just uh, just found a great appreciation for quality ingredients, quality food, taking your time making things. We have chef-driven steakhouses. We don't have kitchen managers. So when you come to the restaurant, we, we want a very skilled executive chef in each location, plus a chef de cuisine, plus a sous chef, plus a pastry staff, chef. So it's our point of difference, really, for high-end chain steakhouses. And I think learning, and I worked in the back of house for a long time, I wanted to be a chef. My dad said no. So I opened a catering company and started my own business and realized I should probably get back into the family business. And uh-huh. and um, I think he wanted me to eventually end up in my position now. So that's kind of what his path was for me. A lot of people don't realize this. Our parents gave us zero growing up, no money at all. Like any mm-hmm. money that we wanted, we earned. So my brothers and I would just, we'd miss high school football games. We'd miss a bunch of stuff in school and college just because we wanted to earn as much money as we possibly could. And so at that point, did I like it? Yeah, I love the restaurants, but it was really just, we were trying to make as much money as we could as high school and college kids. But there was always a passion there for food, for service. And I think really what I fell in love with is the servant's heart of just blowing people away when they're in our restaurants. It's this service, so it's not so much food as it is just giving people an experience that they've never that they've never had before, making emotional connections with people. And so we empower our staff to do that. And I think through that, I was really like, I think this is this is what I want to do. That's what I'm passionate about. Was it was it odd for the company to know that okay, we've got a a family member, a DNA member coming in here, or was that comforting for the company? No, it kind of sucked actually because you, really? you have a bullseye on your on your back and you have to be the first one in and the last one out. I wouldn't take it back because we worked a lot harder than probably uh, we had to. But it was definitely there. There were t- some times that it was very difficult. But what's cool now is I think that the people who are still with us are a lot of our general managers. They've been with us for a long time. They, I think, they see that we really worked very hard to get where we are. And so when the reins were finally handed off and passed over, there's a, there's a mutual respect that I think that they have for me and my brothers and vice versa. Well, I hear in your story and what I know, you know, Britt and I have been friends for a while, and it's one thing to look at the business dynamics and the leadership dynamics that you're in, which I want to talk about in a moment, but it's another thing to just look beneath the surface and go, this is a woman who gets stuff done. This is a woman who pushes, who who has drive and who doesn't allow things just to happen to her, which is why we have the aggressive life. That's what aggression yeah. is. It's not it's not steamrolling. It's not powering up on somebody. Mm-hmm. It's just saying, this is my life. This is where I want to go. And I'm going to err on the side of action instead of inaction. Thank you very much. It means where a lot. did that come from? My dad really, I didn't always see eye to eye with his process of taking us through each position and where we are now. But, you know, I graduated from UC and I thought I was putting on a power suit and he's like, you're putting on a server suit. <laughs> mm. So he always That's had, a quote. That's a quote. Yeah. That's he, fantastic. He always had a method to his madness. And when you're in your twenties, you're just, you want to know how it all plays out. And, and so it was humbling and it was the best decision that he made. And I will probably, if the, if my children want to get, there's no way I would change anything that he did. That means what for your day-to-day life right now? Like, what do you see yourself doing that's on that sort of serving side versus the power side? Well, now I'm in a business role. So we were growing, expanding. um, And so that for me has been a lot of my focus. And I try to get out of the way of the people who are (laughs) better than me. And so the restaurants have highly effective quality managers and staff. So we have 720 employees across the company and they all do a very good job. For me, it's still casting the vision and my dad still does this casting the vision about here's what we do. Here's the reason why we do it, but getting out of the way and let them do what they do best. I was so inspired. I was in Nashville and I, uh, I was meeting with a, uh, well, mutual friend of ours who was a friend of mine now because he was a friend of yours first, Brian Welch, the uh, guitarist. Uh, you clue me in that he loves Jeff Ruby carrot cake. 
Yeah, so, he's crazy about it. Oh, he is. <laughs> so I called, I called the Jeff Ruby Steakhouse in Nashville, going to buzz by and just pick it up. And no one was there initially. I got a recording. Have you listened to, have you listened mm-hmm. to the recording recently? Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Could you, do you, could you quote it for us? Oh, people don't come to my restaurants because they're hungry. They can go to their refrigerators for that. They come to our restaurants to celebrate life. <laughs> oh, man. I heard, that. I heard that and I was like, oh, my goodness. I just got inspired from an answering. Say it again. Say it again. People don't come to my restaurant because they're hungry. They can go to their refrigerators for that. They come to our restaurants to celebrate life. I thought that was so good. Not just, um, it was, it was good for me on two levels. One is I'm, I'm very utilitarian. I wouldn't say I'm frugal. I'm utilitarian. Like I'll spend a lot of money, but it's in my mind, I've got to say, well, that's because it's this one piece of gear that might save my life when I'm on a mountain in Colorado, which is likely never going to happen. But you know, I feel that way. I always feel guilty when I go out to eat. It's something that's more than you know, $10 a plate or something like that. Um, I do it. Mm-hmm. I do. I, I spend money on, on meals a little bit. I go out to, but I always have this thing. And when I heard your dad do that, it did two things for me. First was, yeah, that is, that is really a flipping the script. I'm not, I'm not coming to a nice restaurant simply to have food. That's going to go down a sewage pipe 12, 12 hours later. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not necessarily paying for filling my stomach, I'm paying for experience. The second thing that hit me about it was that's such a clear vision. I don't know if I'm that clear these days with the people who report to me or who work for me or who might come to the, to my day job. I just thought that was phenomenal. For us, we, we were a $110 check average. So each person typically now give or take, but when you're coming in, you're going to spend a hundred dollars at least. And, oh, I'm going to spend more than that. If well, I come we know in. what you drink. So, <laughs> No. So when they come in, though, we say there's got to be an ROI on, on this. What is the value? Which is hard to say what's the value of a Jeff Ruby restaurant or experience because it's such a high, high price point. Um, but we want people walking out saying, man, that's the best money I've ever spent in my life. And I, I kind of think about it. If you're going to go gambling, you've got a couple hundred bucks, you know what your budget is. You're going there to just entertain yourself and have fun. For us, it's it's what is the ROI of, and also the risk that you have going to another restaurant because there's there's restaurants that don't focus on service. They've got great food, but it's almost as if they're doing you a favor. And we have the complete opposite. Like I said, ser- the servant's heart mentality where thank you for coming to our restaurants. We're going to blow you away. We're going to make any type of emotional connection we can with you. And by the way, we're going to have great food, but when you walk out of here, we want you to be proud of the money you just spent. That's fantastic. Here we go. Everyone who's listening to The Aggressive Life, listen up, boys and girls. Listen up, listen up. This is a woman who's thinking beyond in the food industry. This is part of what aggression looks like. She's she's digging under for a meaning, a meaning that is there, but she's finding it. I think a lot of us have meaning in our jobs but we're not finding it. I think a lot of us have jobs and we're in industries where there is an incredibly high purpose, incredibly great thing, but we're, we're not seeing that. I don't, I don't know that I would have ever thought about food that way, but you have, and, and your family has, and I'm glad you have. And I think that's probably because you're looking for it. You're looking for meaning there. Mm -hmm. You're not just hoping you stumble on it. You've looked for it and you found it. I, I think that's great. Thank you. So if we, if we look now at, at your situation, your dad's got this really great voice, cast this great vision, built this thing. I mean, a lot of, a lot of good meals have been had. And then you come in and we have the whole succession thing. (laughs) How, how has succession gone for you? I got lucky. I, I tell people that, you know, Hilton came to me through uh, my mentor, Russell Mangus. Who's who's Hilton? Hilton, like Hilton Brands, the hotels. Oh, okay, okay. I never worked outside the restaurants ever. And so I always miss the opportunity to work for another business, which is, that's why I'm I'm getting my MBA right now, because I always, I want to continue to learn and see how other businesses are doing it. Russell was a GM uh, for my dad in 1986 at the waterfront, and then he went and opened China, Hilton's, Times Square, Mexico. He was all over. And then recently, 
few five years ago landed in Chicago. My dad always asked him to come be the president of our company or vice president. He just he never did because he was with Hilton. And when he finally was about to retire his last three years, he said he called and said, I want to move back to Cincinnati, set you up to scale, mentor Brittany, mentor your team, position you to grow. And he did that. And so I had hands on crazy training from Russell when I went to corporate, started as a guest relations manager. So I had Russell's, 15. Russell's last name is? Mancus. Oh, I thought it was Upsom Chow. <laughs> You've never heard that before? No. I'm like, <laughs> but I'll figure it out. This is, the, this is the gift you get by being in a very, uh, get it, Russell Upsom Chow? Anyway, go back, back, back to so, where we were. So he came in and succession plan, um, he literally just, after three years, handed me the keys and said, I told your dad you're ready to go. Uh, so that was... That was different because I always had my dad mentoring me, amazing mind, um, he's genius level intelligence, great businessman, and he's got this entrepreneurial spirit, this creativity where he's always, always pushing the envelope. Russell brought a different dynamic from a business and structure standpoint to me that I'll always be grateful for. Now the succession plan, I think, yes, we do have a plan and my brothers, uh, I have to say, we would not have grown if they didn't if they weren't part of it. So literally, because we opened a restaurant, I moved to Nashville for six months. Brandon moved to Columbus. Lexington's so close, but Dylan was really the hands-on who owned that restaurant. And they both have the ability to get into that market, to train, to hire, and and literally open a Jeffrey B restaurant. So it's kind of secret secret weapon we have for expansion. But um, they're, they're a huge part of it, and we work really well together. We didn't always work well together, and that was probably the hardest thing with succession is um, we had to have some real conversations as a family. We had some family uh, meetings. Um, you know, we include the spouses in those meetings. We we talk very directly if something's bothering us. If something is, we either handle it one-on-one or we go as a group and talk about it together depending on what the context of the issue is. So, so we had a few of those meetings with that involved where we really hashed out a lot of a lot of things where we are now is one of the most functional health I, I think healthiest family businesses that I've ever seen because it can it can get really ugly yeah it can because I think people don't ask what's bothering you what and talk about it and sort through it and we've done that so my dad I think would say the biggest challenge is his overall control where you know he he feels because he's not in the day to day every single day at the office running the company, and he doesn't want that. But when things come in, because he's never had a great meal in one of our restaurants ever, <laughs> he's always you know always the quality assurance director where it's this wasn't up to par, this wasn't. And I'm like, that's great. Continue to do that. Interesting. Continue to never have a good rest a meal at our restaurant because that will continue to push us and drive. Yeah. Uh, the quality of our food and, and of our, our brand ultimately. I find them similar. When I go to a crossroads site where I'm not preaching and I show up, I am always bummed out. Oh, wow. That's that's my dad. <laughs> I am always bummed out. I, I mean, there's stuff for me to encourage, and I'll see sure. things that I want to encourage people on. Yeah. But I walk out of going home, and yeah. we've got to, you know, you know, every time. I pointed this out to him a few days ago because he called an all-meeting with a staff meeting with probably not all staff, but 10 of my directors at corporate. But it was really two issues. I think one was French fries weren't where they needed to be. They weren't the right color. And one was a personnel issue. And so when I said, you know, for me as a daughter, I'm like, look, here's where we are. We know specifically what our positioning is in the market based on our comp set. So I know that what the guests are saying based on every single social site. And I take that and I average that. My, my team does that, averages it to where our top five best restaurants are. And we're 101% of the competition. That's what I go back to are the metrics that, you know, but we're still doing pretty good. We still are, in my opinion, the best in that city. We have to be. Now, are we constantly striving? We dip down. Sometimes we're 99, 100, but we know what it is. And we make sure every single complaint that comes in gets addressed. And it's like, a, it's a full corrective action plan. I mean, we even go through video to make sure that, because I want to back my team up as well, if it's not a true statement. So there's a process for all of it. But I think what what's amazing is that we're able to live this out with him. He's still chairman. He's still highly involved. He still is ambitious. He does all of those things. And, uh, and then the kids and I get to do the boring stuff. (laughs) He does bring up a good point. Let's go back to a foodie question for a moment. I haven't seen your fries, 
but I continue to be struggles. Why is it so hard for restaurants to have fries that are crunchy? Because they go bad in two minutes. I don't understand that. So when no, you, no, no, yes, no. They, they come they, out when they're white and they're when they're soggy and white. And they no, die they weren't in two in minutes. Enough. They die in two minutes on the line. So while we're trying to get everything else ready, and most of the time our team gets it right, but but fries that is like your your number one waste is because if five minutes is up in the window, you got to fry new ones. Okay. But I can go to some restaurants and they can pull it straight out of the fryer. That's right. And I'm going, why isn't it in there for another half minute? Oh, yeah, it should be. That's yes. He's going to love this portion. He should. Yeah. Jeff Ruby, <laughs> stay in the business because your daughter can't handle the fry color. Oh, my god. Stay in it. <laughs> That's hilarious. Right. That's his thing. I literally, so I said to my brother, there were there's 10 pet peeves. And I said, Brandon, create an SOP, owner pet peeves. I don't care how you want to how you want to message this in a more positive way. I think it was you get what you inspect, not what you expect. And that should go to managers and chefs. There are 10 things when we don't have the mats down in the restaurant. Just there are things that will just piss him off. And um, the fries is number one. <laughs> you, back to you seeing things and pushing on things. I think that's an admirable character quality for you, Brittany. It's not just like the the meaning of food and expensive restaurants. I've seen it other places. I ran across a video of you speaking to a room full of uh, young women who are competing, I think, for the uh, Young Ohio Miss Teen or some... Miss Ohio and Miss Teen Miss Ohio, contestants. So some beauty pageant yeah. contestants. I mean, is that still okay yeah. to say? Because they I, are. They're beauty pageant they're, they're, contestants. Okay, okay. Yeah. so... And, and I saw you uh, com- speaking with them. I said, oh, I don't know how to listen to this. I'm, I've never been behind the scenes when women are talking to women about beauty pageant stuff. So, mm-hmm. And you had some really fascinating, insightful things that I would not have thought would relate to beauty pageants. Mm, thank you. Do you remember what a couple of those are or should I feed them to you? <laughs> we talked about value. You're not going in to fig- find out if you're beautiful or not on the front end, you already are. And the value and the identity that you have within yourself and, and how to kind of, you know, think about those things. We talked about emotional connections with each other and that there's always two to three things that you just don't know about somebody who's sitting to the left and right. And they could have very traumatic things that have happened or they could be great things, but that everybody has a past. And so be thinking about the experience if they're going through the pageant, uh, it's being kind to people. It's being kind to the lighting people. Yeah. It's being, you know, it's just uh, knowing what your purpose is. And then we talked about control, alt, delete. And I felt like I was supposed to tell them control, alt, delete. And just a quick thing, it was control your thoughts, take your thoughts captive, alternate your thoughts. So if you're going down negative road and you're like, you should be over this thing by now, it, who knows how long that is. That could be five years. It could be 30 minutes when you're obsessing over something, take your thoughts captive, control them. Then you alternate them and you speak truth to yourself. So it's probably the opposite of what this crazy thought is that's in your mind anyways. And then you delete it. Once you've able to, once you're able to finally move on from something, then just delete it. And that means turn away from it. And when you can recognize that you're going down negative roads, stop it right there and just get rid of it. And I, my favorite quote is from Claire Bartons, the founder of the American Red Cross Association. And she says, I distinctly remember forgetting it when somebody wronged her and they're like, how can you just get over it? You choose to forget that stuff. And so that's what I felt like I was supposed to talk to those amazing females about. Well, and you also about. told them, uh, you know, a room full of beautiful women. You also told them, hey, everyone's going to lose in here except for one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and get ready for life. Yeah. That's what life is. You also talked about you're learning to present yourself for the rest of your life. Yeah. You're going to have to learn to present that yourself. In fact, all of us, I don't training. care if you're male, female, good looking, bad looking. It's, it's training for that. Mm-hmm. I, I thought that was, again, another example of you seeing meaning in something, um, looking for meaning, aggressively choosing to find meaning and then speaking it into people. I thought that was I thought that was strong, really strong. Thank you very much. And you're also doing a lot of meaningful things for for you, food isn't even meaningful enough. You're doing a lot of other really cool things with your foundation. Tell us about that. Well, we said, my dad has always been very, very charitable, given to a million different causes over the past almost 40 years that the company has been around. And when Caleb, my husband was done playing football, he went and did a ton of international missions, 
particularly with Irish Global and, and orphanages, and then started getting seeing what was going on through city servants and citywide initiatives. And, and he really challenged and said, you should talk to your dad about what his legacy is going to be because you guys have so much opportunity to fo- just get laser focused on one thing. And, and I think there's, there's, you know, everybody has their cause. That's what makes the world go round. It could be breast cancer, could be Alzheimer's research, whatever it is that's near and dear to your heart. For my dad, it was really clear because he never had a, had a father growing up. Um, for us, um, our goal is to take Cincinnati off the top five childhood poverty lists. And there's an interesting um, kind of way when you think about prevention, intervention, reacting. For us, it's trying to plug a dam right now in what we believe the overall issue, the um, piece of the puzzle that would drastically change the cycle of poverty, and that's trying to find kids' homes that are in the Hamilton County foster care system. So there's 3,000. There was 2,400 last year, I think, and now we're up to about 3,000. And so by supporting some of the the initiatives that we support, Coalition of Care is one of them, Wraparound Care, you know, I tell people all the time that you don't have to foster. Like, that's a big deal. I, I would love for everybody to foster. But you can also, if you have something in your heart where you are just dying to, like, be part of that, um, if you can mentor or wrap around the actual foster kids, the success rate goes from 50% dropping out to, like, uh, a success rate of 90%. Stay with the kid if somebody is there to babysit or make them a lasagna. I mean, there's so many opportunities to be involved. So so our foundation is really focused on foster care system. Um, and fostering has been a big deal for just your life growing up and your current family right now. Yeah, yeah. We had kids, and my dad never formally fostered, but he, we, I have 20 surrogate brothers or so where, um, you know, th- three of them, are really like my brothers, Griff, Nick, and Jake, and their their real father passed away, then their stepfather passed away. And my dad came in and just, I'm dad. Like, they sought him out. Somebody introduced them. Amazing kids, but they're, they know that he's there whenever, I mean, they're, they're going on our family vacation tomorrow. Griff is coming. So I think just being exposed to having other family members always around was normal for us. And we had an amazing, amazing experience with that. And so for us, you know, we've got kids and families that I know that they know that if something went wrong, they can call us and we're there. And that's right now my level of commitment to foster care. But that's, you know, what I was exposed to growing up. Foster care is near and dear to my heart as well. I'm I'm adopted, which is a part of it. Anybody who has been adopted knows that it would have been very easy to not be adopted and to be in a situation like that. Yeah. Um, but then at the same time, you know, my wife has done a lot with some f- kids who are in the foster situation, and it has been very, very difficult, yeah. like really difficult. Because yep. um, yeah. a lot of folks who are in foster, a lot of kids who are in foster care, they've got some real issues, you yeah. know? Well, they bounce around, and that's yes. the problem because it's not one plus one plus one for trauma. It's... It's exponential. So every time they're bouncing around, the trauma is, and then you they lose sometimes six you, months of development. Is the statistic I had? Every time they move, they go backwards six months. So they're not ten; they're nine and a half. Yeah, or and might even you, been a year, something like sense. that. And then you've got the post traumatic stress, and and God knows what they've been through. And so that's for us. The wraparound care is trying to when you when you can help as soon as possible wrap around these families so that they don't get bounced to the next house and the next house. Uh, that's, that's a big part of our goal, but there's so much more with the foundation that we're working on. But for us, phase one is really, is focusing on that. Mentors are a big aspect of it. You've, Mm -hmm. you've mentioned here, you've been mentored by Russell and some other folks and you're just passing that on to some other people any way you can. Yep. All right. Hey, let's take a break here. And let me tell you, this episode is brought to you by Groove Life. You can get 15% off your next silicone ring or watch band at GrooveLife.com. The promo code is TOME15. Right now, I'm wearing one of these rings. I've been wearing these rings, one of these rings nonstop for a long time. So if you want to try one of these out, they're pretty darn cool and affordable. You can use promo code TOME15 and you can get 15% off. All right. Are you ready for the lightning round, Brittany Ruby Miller? 
I say something and you answer in two to three sentences or less. The less is better. Are you ready? Okay. Favorite meal at one of your restaurants? Caesar salad. <laughs> Favorite dinner wine? Oh, Cleo Rioja. I had it last night. Favorite after dinner bourbon? Oh, that's a good one. Mine, Maker's Mark and Molly Wellman. <laughs> Go to dessert? Cheesecake. If you had to eat a meal at a restaurant that you don't own, what restaurant would that be? Probably Via Vite or Forno. I think those are the last two that I love. And Hibachi Master on Beachmont Avenue. Ooh, I like the diversity there. That's good. Best day on the job. Watching my server, who's now actually, he's a corporate trainer, Nate Leopold, served a couple their 50th wedding anniversary in a nursing home. They couldn't make it to the restaurant based on health. And so he set up an entire Jeffrey experience at the nursing home, and that was really cool. Wow. Wow. Dream location for the next Ruby restaurant. Hmm. I can't tell you. I'd have to kill you. Oh, you're already working on this then. <laughs> okay. I, I, want, I want to have you divulge company secrets. <laughs> Biggest lesson you've learned about leadership? I think, too, you have to be quality person if you're going to be a good leader. Um, you can't fake that. And listen, you got God gave you uh, two ears and one mouth. Listen. If I could have a meal with one person in the Bible, it would be? And you can't say Jesus because that's always the answer. You can't say that one. Yeah. Because that's the all-inclusive one. If I could have dinner with one person in the Bible, who would it be? Probably Paul. Oh, okay. Why? Yeah. He was in prison for like a really long time, right? Yes. He wrote uh, lots of letters about how to find peace. And Romans eight twenty eight. all things work together for those who are called to court. How do you write that while you're in prison or after you've been through? So I find a lot of peace through a lot of his writings. Well, you're right that the whole difficulty thing it's a big deal right mm -hmm. now. I mean, for me, I'm reflecting on this. Uh, we just released um, Phantom Lake, which is a bingeable series on Amazon Prime. I binged last night. Oh, did you binge it? It was off? incredible. Oh. It was incredible. Uh, well, thank you. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> on the second or third day of filming, everything was going wrong, man. Just everything. Kicking people off the trip, people going to emergency room. Um, that's where I am now. I oh, got that's where into, you are? Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll stop right there. So, no, keep going. <laughs> no, no, so, so, and and the crew was coming up to me and saying, the film crew going, oh my gosh, this is really bad. The the quote unquote, the devil's ha the devil has us under attack. Hmm. And I stopped and I said, why do we feel like difficulty is always of the devil? Why, right. why do we, why do we feel that? I said, this is great TV here right now. I yeah. said that in the moment. We have a lot of tension. We've got a lot of drama. And who tunes in to watch a show where there's no tension, no drama? Right. And that's exactly what happened. Every day, every filming day had some massive thing that was really, really difficult. And we look back and say, yeah, all that difficulty, that was from God. In fact, every good story is born out of difficulty. When do we ever talk about the vacations that went well? We talk ones about the ones that were crappy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so with Paul in those prisons, I mean, his story was being developed in a powerful way that it wouldn't have been developed if he was just lounging on a beach. Yep. You know? very, yeah, very true. And things happen also. Things, just life happens. And what are you going to do in the middle of that? And I agree with you where you give credit to the enemy. It's like, or that's just happened. Deal with it. And I think that's what keeps some of us from being aggressive we're, we're almost like afraid that bad things might happen if I start pushing on things or I don't want to rile things up or something like that. No, bad things are going to happen if you just sit still. <laughs> That's when bad things happen. If you're pushing, you might make a mistake, but it's always a mistake you can recover from because you're pushing because God is an entity who pushes. He goes. He loves. He pours into. He forgives. He strategizes. And the more we can be on that side, the better we'll be. Well, I'll make sure you have the last word. Uh, Brittany, anything else you want to talk about here? Anything you're saying, oh, man, you should have asked me about this. I want to talk about that. You can have the last word. I want to take this opportunity. I don't know that I've ever done this ever um, in an interview and honor my dad and thank him because I know he's listening 
for making it really hard on us growing up. And I appreciate that more than he probably could ever imagine. And though he made it hard on us, he really held our hand through it, through the leadership and the guidance and the trust that we have now and the empowerment to work together. Dad, um, I just want to say thank you. And, um, you know, you are, you are my hero. You're my, the greatest mentor I could have ever had. And so, um, but I will try to outshine you and get as many listeners as possible so that I can bump you off the top three. Yeah. <laughs> the competition is on. I, I, tell I you handle what. our marketing, so I know how to. Oh, there I you go. I can do just 70,000 followers, but I have a secret weapon, 200,000 on my email database. Oh. So I'm going to do a push. All you people who follow Jeffrey B. Culinary Entertainment on our email, you're getting one. You're getting one. <laughs> all right. Now, normally someone says something that's not all that interesting, so that's the end of the podcast. But you just said something that's very, very interesting. You thanked your dad. How do you put it? For making life hard on you? Mm -hmm. That's really countercultural in this age of helicopter parents or, or, you know, the latest one, you know, lawnmower parents. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you know the difference between those whole things? No. So helicopter parents is someone who hovers over and just plucks them out. Lawnmower parents are always going before their kid and mm. chopping everything down in front of them to make it easy. Don't do that. That makes sense. Yeah. Tell us how. Tell us how your dad made it hard for you. Um, like I said, he didn't. He made us earn everything. So when I got promotions growing up, it was because my supervisor thought I was ready for the promotion. We earned everything. So when we opened Carlo and Johnny, for instance, I was in college, and and the only time he gave me money was when I would make the dean's list. He would give me five hundred dollars cash. So. That motivated me to be on Dean's list. That would motivate me too. <laughs> but he made it hard in a very healthy, healthy way where his love was always abundant. He is the king of affirmations and making you feel good about yourself. Almost to where, where I'm in the office, I'm like, don't do it in front of anybody because they're going to, you know, it's just sometimes odd and I don't want to get the credit in front of people. I'd, I would just assume to kind of go unnoticed. But he is amazing through the process of letting you know how he feels about you, um, his love for you, even if you're a Ruby or not. I think his employees probably would attest to that as well. Um, I always knew that I was valued. And there was never an issue that I was a female too, which is another gift. He loves having a female president. Hmm. And he sees the value that women bring to the workplace. And he's just, you know, so it's just been a, a great gift. But he made it hard you know, when back, not now, because we were the employer, we try to be employer of choice and give people off when they want off. But it was like, you can't work on, you can't go on Saturday nights. You have to work Saturday nights. That's so, you know, I was always working on Saturday nights. And I thought, you know, well, I kind of want to like go to a high school football game or um, I should get off at one of the, was that I was dating Caleb and he was playing for the Bengals and there was like stuff to do on Sundays. <laughs> and if I was, had to be at work, I had to be at work. And that was that. That made me earn it. All right, Brittany, if people want to follow up with you or actually follow you, how can they know what's going on in your life? Do you have any social media accounts or anything like that people can hang out with or books you want to have people buy? No, I don't have any books yet, Brian. You don't have any books? No, we can't all be like uh, Brian. Your no. Dad, your, no, your dad has a book because every answer, <laughs> every question you said, you have to read my book. Which read is really book. good, not counting tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, no, they can follow me on Instagram, Brit Ruby Miller, or I think um, Brittany Ruby Miller on Facebook. All right. Yeah. There you have it, boys and girls. Woman who has gone places and is going places who is aggressive. Brittany Miller, thank you for coming here to The Aggressive Life. Thanks for having me. It was awesome. Hey, thanks for listening. For more aggressive living, head over to bryantome.com. Get signed up to the mailing list to get regular shots of positive aggression sent straight to your inbox. And while you're there, you can also find articles, podcasts, and books. I'm also active on Instagram. Search Brian Tome. Special thanks to the band Judges for the music. Aggressive Life with Brian Tome is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.